Hi, I'm Ken Johnson with another episode of SecCast. In this episode, we will cover the basics of HTTP. We will demonstrate using an intercepting proxy to review requests and responses. We'll discuss the most prevalent HTTP methods in use, explain what a document object model is, discuss the same origin policy, and review the most prevalent HTTP response codes. Let's get started. We're going to go ahead and log into this application. And when we submit our credentials to the application, we're going to intercept that request as well as responses and sort of review them to understand them. So what you're looking at is a piece of software that sits between our client and the remote web application. It allows us to view those requests. It allows us to modify requests as well as responses. And it gives us a granular view of what's going on underneath the hood. Now as you look at this request, there are a few important details. The first is the type of HTTP method being used, which is a post. And you can see this in the top left hand portion of this request. Additionally, you'll notice an annotation that says forward slash sessions. This indicates the HTTP path and finally the HTTP protocol next to it, which is version 1.1. And that's fairly common. The top portion of the request is known as the header section. In this request, it ends after content length. You can tell where the headers and body begin because they are separated by two new line characters, similar to if you had hit the return button twice on your system's keyboard. This is an HTTP standard, so it's uniform across the board. In the body of the request, you can see parameters which are common in a post request and follows the HTTP standard. The header section typically indicates things like your user agent so the application knows what type of browser you are using, your cookie so that you may authenticate. If this is a post request, it's common to see the content length header. This indicates the size of the request's body. There are many HTTP headers available, and as you work with web applications more frequently, you'll begin to understand their purpose. Lastly, the first line of an HTTP request will indicate the HTTP method the path portion of where this is going on the remote application and the HTTP protocol version which I said is typically version 1.1. We'll go ahead and forward this request on and when we do that we want to review the response. You'll see a 302 response code here. We talk about response codes a little bit more in depth but that basically says we're going to be redirected and the location header tells us where we're going to be redirected to and then there's the body of the response. When we forward this request on, we see the next request is to forward slash dashboard forward slash home. The important thing to note here is the absence of a body common in GET requests. And we receive a response of 200 or OK. And this just means everything is working as normal. And again, you see the response headers. And there is a response body here that we sort of want to review and we can look at the raw response this gets interpreted by our browser and that's how the web page shows up we have this render tab in our proxy unfortunately JavaScript and CSS is not rendered properly in that tab so it just looks a little funky and we'll forward on these requests and move on to the next section In this section, we're going to talk a little bit about HTTP methods. You'll also hear them called HTTP verbs. The first verb or method we will discuss is the get method. The important thing to know about a get method is it typically does not have a body and the parameters are sent in the path portion of the request. This differs from a post request, which has its parameters in the body of the request. The put method is usually used when you interact with a RESTful web API. If you've ever reviewed the traffic coming out of a mobile device, you might see this. And often when the need to add content to a site arises, you'll see the put method used. Much like the put method, the delete method is typically used when interacting with a RESTful API, but unlike the put request, this is typically used to remove content from an application. 
The head method is similar to the get method, although when using head, the application will only return the response headers and not the body. Lastly, the options method can be used to determine what HTTP methods are supported by a URL or application endpoint. But you'll also see this header when your browser performs a cross-origin resource sharing or cores request. Now, this is not a full list of all HTTP methods in existence, but rather a list of commonly seen HTTP verbs or methods. In this section, we discuss the document object model. I'm using Firefox and a plugin for Firefox named Firebug. And this plugin allows me to sort of peek under the hood of what's going on inside my browser. So we'll open up the DOM tab and review briefly the attributes. Now, I don't want to go necessarily into what each of them are but rather want you to know that they exist, they're responsible for how the web page is rendered, and want you to look at the attributes and see that they have values assigned to them. So without going too in-depth, it's just important to know that each of these attributes and their values are assigned via HTML and JavaScript and can be modified by the currently loaded web page. But this does not mean another web page could interact with that DOM. We go into that a little bit in the same origin policy section of this tutorial. But ultimately, the DOM is where directives are set and is really the engine that is responsible for how we interact with a website. In this section we discuss the same origin policy and really this is used as a constraint mechanism to ensure safer web browsing. Ultimately this same origin policy dictates that one site's HTML, JavaScript, and CSS cannot interact with another site's DOM. Basically if you have two tabs open in your browser they each have their own individual DOM settings and the two cannot access each other's settings. This helps ensure that cookies provided by one site, for example, cannot be sent or retrieved by another site. Now, to provide a visual demonstration of the same origin policy, I'm going to use a cross-site scripting or XSS attack against RailsGoat in order to have JavaScript execute and grab our cookie from the DOM. This cookie will be shown in an alert box. Now, we show you cookies in both browsers. What you'll notice is when RailsGoat's JavaScript executes and shows the cookie, it only shows its cookies and does not show the JSessionID cookie that grails.nv has saved in its DOM properties. Basically, this reinforces the fact that one web page should not be able to access the DOM of another. Okay, so what we're going to do is close out the DOM. And we're going to go to the registration form of RailsGoat, fill in some properties, and we'll go to the first name property and we'll write some JavaScript that says put the document.cookie in an alert box. And you'll notice that this cookie is just the Rails Goat session cookie and not the cookie of grails.nv, which is a J session ID cookie. So you see nowhere in there is a J session ID cookie. Thus, the same origin policy has protected us. Now, as you advance your web app hacking knowledge, you'll soon come to realize that there are ways to circumvent the intended protections that same origin policy gives us. These are things like cross-site scripting, CSERF, insecure course configurations. But for now, we just want you to be aware of the same origin policy and what its purpose is. Lastly, we'll discuss HTTP response codes. Now, you saw some response codes when we were performing request and response transactions. 200 and 302 have already been shown, but I'll cover them. 200 just means everything's okay and the page is being rendered as normal. A 302 is typically accompanied by a location header. So this specifies to your browser that you're about to be redirected and the location header tells it where it should be redirected to. 400 typically means you've made a bad request, something unsupported. 
401 unauthorized and 403 forbidden. Specify that your credentials were incorrect or you do not have authorization to reach the application. 404 is a very common and means that the resource you requested has not been found. And 500 is always an interesting error. A 500 error indicates that there is an internal server error. So something you sent to the application caused it to malfunction. And when performing injection tests, you should probe into this a little bit further. I'm Ken Johnson. This has been another episode of SetCast. Thanks for watching.